Hi, everybody. Um, sorry about that slight delay there. Uh, we will kick off and hope that the um, Deputy Mayor Anula Ristani will be joining us very soon. Uh, so my name is Vanessa Norwood. I'm Creative Director of the Building Centre here in London. This is the first in our city series of sustainability sessions. And we are going to be look at, looking at Tirana, transforming Tirana with, De with Deputy Mayor Anula Ristani. So the sustainability sessions are the Building Centre's series of talks exploring aspects of sustainability in the built environment. The second series is on city scale and focuses on urban design and policies that support our city's transition towards net zero. So Anula Ristani is the Deputy Mayor of Tirana in char charge of international affairs and sustainable development. She joined the city in 2015 as the Chief of Staff and was appointed deputy after the 2019 election. She has overseen the Green City Action Plan, the Tirana Child Friendly Agenda, and the Resilience and Sustainability Strategies. So Albania is a country on the cusp of change, led by Prime Minister Edi Rama, who famously painted the capital city Tirana's grey communist era buildings in bright colours. The Eastern European country has emerged from the isolation of its communist past. Alongside Tirana's mayor, Arian Veliaj, Edi Rama has overseen a transformation that has culture at its heart, and the vision is bold, and some of Europe's finest contemporary architects have been invited to lead the change. The policies of urban change, primarily in Tirana, are aimed at increasing green and pedestrian areas, improving air quality, enabling use of alternative means of transport, and making the city a more child-friendly space. And it really is a wonderful city. Um, before I introduce you to Anula, I'm very, very pleased that we have a special guest with us this Wednesday lunchtime, Her Majesty's Ambassador to Albania, Alistair King-Smith, and I'd like to say welcome, Alistair, probably welcome to London and welcome to Tirana, as you're very new in this role. Um, did you want to say a few words, Alistair, about, about your, what your remit's going to be over the coming years? So over Wonderful. to you. Wonderful. Well, um, Vanessa, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me in what is my first uh, full week. Uh, I only presented credentials as Her Majesty's Ambassador here in uh, Tirana uh, last week on Wednesday, as many of you uh, may have uh, seen. It's my great pleasure to be here as British Ambassador, and as you say, actually, Vanessa, on a really important time, both for Albania um, and with some really interesting areas um, for Albania's future development, but also for the United Kingdom. Uh, obviously, uh, many of you will may, may, may um, uh, sigh when I mention the word Brexit, uh, but actually one of the things that post uh, us as the UK coming out of the European Union means that we are looking to refresh our relationships across the world, but particularly with close allies like Albania, where not only are we close uh, in uh, terms of being uh, part of the European continent, uh, in NATO, uh, the uh, Albania will be on the UN Security Council, we'll see it alongside the UK and other countries over the next two years. So at the national level, uh, it's really important, uh, but actually also um, uh, for a number of other reasons, that also applies to Tirana, um, as I will um, come on to. Now, of course, I am very new, so I'm still uh, looking at how the UK can uh, best develop our relationships and our engagement over the next four years. But I do come with a mandate to uh, look at how we can do that um, across uh, the board. We've had a very long and fruitful relationship with Albania in a number of fields, whether that's supporting Albania's democratic development, uh, whether it's supporting joint collaboration on security issues. But actually there's some new fields. And as you'll know, um, the UK is hosting the climate change talks, COP26 uh, in November, in Glasgow, and there will be presidency for the coming year. So your point about actually the green economy, climate change and the environment are very much going to be the fore, to the forefront of what the UK focuses on uh, over the coming three to four years. Um, the other aspect where I think, again, Tirana plays a very interesting role, but also Albania um, uh, more generally, uh, is around the digital and technology agenda, somewhere where the UK is going to be positioning ourselves as a, an international uh, tech and science uh, superpower. And we want to be really collaborating with other countries uh, like Albania and elsewhere around shared agendas. 
and looking at together how we can uh, craft uh, positive futures for the British people uh, and for uh, the Albanian people. Uh, and then last, um, uh, specific to uh, Tirana, I'm delighted uh, when I was talking to uh, the mayor of Tirana, Erion Veliai, um, to discuss with him plans for, um, uh, the, for Tirana to be European youth capital uh, next year. And that I think will give us um, a whole range of different elements uh, to um, uh, think about in terms of uh, engaging the dimensions that can support uh, young people uh, in Albania, but also links to uh, Britain um, as well. Um, but the topic of this conversation, of course, is, is very relevant around sustainability. Um, and we in the UK also have just, as you may know, brought our international development ministries and uh, foreign affairs ministries together. Um, and so one of the things that I'll be looking at is how we can make sure that everything we as the UK do uh, actually plays into that longer term aspect of sustainability. So I'm looking forward to hearing um, uh, colleagues' uh, views on this, uh, to thinking about how urban settings are a key part of those uh, future areas uh, for development, uh, and then looking at the uh, exciting areas around that and where Britain, Britain and uh, uh, Albania, whether as governments, but also British people and uh, Albanians uh, can also collaborate together and how we can facilitate that. So thank you very much for inviting me to uh, join you today. I wish all of these discussions and future ones uh, all success um, and very much look forward to be part of that over time. Thank you, Alistair. Yes, here's to collaboration. I think there's a lot we can learn as well from the way things are being done in Tirana. And on that note, I will say yes, thank you very much, Alistair, and good luck with your, with your new role of which I am deeply envious. Um, I'm sure you'll do a great job. And I'm gonna hand over now to Deputy Mayor uh, Anula Ristani and say thank you very much for joining us and we're looking forward to, to hearing about all the great things you've been doing in Tirana. So over to you Anula, thank you. Thank you so much Vanessa and thank you for having Tirana here today. Um, and thank you Ambassador and welcome to Tirana. We still haven't met so that is just to show how uh, fresh you are in the city. Um, so hopefully, you know, sharing a little bit of, of where we're coming from and what this is about and um, how we've come so far uh, will be both um, informative for for everybody who's joined here today, but also also for, for you here in Tirana. Um, I have a little presentation um, and I thought slides would help a little bit more rather than slide just pictures um, on giving a little bit of a context of where we are in the city. Um, and so I'm just gonna, you know, uh, bear, if you could just bear with me for a second here so that I could share my screen. Okay, <laughs> so here we go. Um, so I'm not gonna delay this any longer. I don't know how much you know about Tirana. So I'm just giving you a little bit of a context of where we are and where we are politically, so yes. Um, this is the post-Brexit, our attempt to join what you guys have just left. <laughs> uh, but we're coming also from 500 years of Ottoman Empire and 50 years from so, sort of a weird Eastern Bloc. So, you know, just to give you a little bit of a historical context. And this was Tirana when it was first founded. We actually celebrated 100 years of Tirana capital um, last year. We were supposed to celebrate uh, if we didn't have a little bit of surprise from COVID. Um, but this was Tirana when it was first founded. So as you can see, it's a little, a little bit bigger than what would a neighborhood look like today. Uh, it was basically just a small village back then. Um, and this is just to show you how much it's evolved since um, this is a Google a satellite image from 89. This is one from 99. This is one from 2009. And this is one from um, 2019. So just to show you guys a little bit of how much it's grown and how aggressively it has grown and how much it has sprawled uh, because of all these changes that we went through. The population has quadrupled from when I was a little girl growing up in Tirana to today we're talking about 1 million citizens. So obviously this has been a very much of an urban shock. 
uh, to to digest all of this absorption of people and 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 um, and coming and investment and and development and how to deal with that from the urban perspective. Um, so where do you start? And we decided to start right from the center. So the ambassador probably um, doesn't know that the Skanderbeg Square um, used to look like a little bit. A, a little bit similar to what it looks today when we were little kids. This was um, the Skanderbeg Square went in, in the late 80s. And as you can see, during communism, we were super isolated here. Um, there were no there was no private property, so there were no private vehicles. So everybody would just walk or or take the, the public transit, and you can see um, two buses in the opposite corners of my screen. And there were only a few, a handful of cars. But then after the Berlin Wall collapsed, then of course we opened up to the world, people started to buy their own cars. And you can see the pedestrian space shrinking, and you can see you know cars invading this center of ours. This is the heart of the city. And uh, up till it got to this. And so this was kind of like uh, the image of uh, the central uh, center of Tirana when we first got into the this office. Um, there was a count at some point of this huge roundabout uh, where 150,000 cars would go round and round every day. Reason for that was because this was not a destination. This was just like a transit place where everybody coming from all corners of the city, they would just first get into the center, they would get into this roundabout before deciding where they were going to go um, in the city. And that was not, you know, the center everybody wanted to live in. And there was not a center um, that, you know, we wanted our city to be represented. So first thing we did in this um, administration back in, in um, 2015 was to start works on the city center. And this was on June 2017, where with the Skanderbeg Square opened. Um, it's not today, it's actually from the day of the opening. So you can see it's very, very, it's empty because the gates have not opened yet and we're preparing for the, the grand opening. Um, and this was when they actually the gates opened. And every time I see this picture, it's just, um, to me, it's such a testimony of people taking back the space. And this is really what it is about, you know, take in the space that was so unfairly taken away from them because of this um, uncontrollable development, because of this, um, I know, rush on getting that, that trophy that was a vehicle and of shrinking what was personal and what was um, individual in terms of space and, and democracy in the city. So this was the day when we first opened. This was uh, the evening when we first opened. And this is how it looks from above. And this is the usage that the central uh, square of Tirana gets. Uh, because of, um, because of you know, climate, climate challenges and because of the heat that can, can be very extreme in the summer, 50% um, of the, of the uh, territory of the central square is um, covered by greenery, so by trees, part of which was um, the project I was, um, I was talking to with EBRD today with the colleagues from London um, for the financing. And it's because the green spaces mitigate really for the high temperatures um, during the summer. And in Tirana, the summer can also get very brutal, uh, up to 40 degrees Celsius um, in in a, in a number of days. So all this greenery really makes up for a nice space at all hours of the of the day. This is how much usage it gets from people in the evenings. They just lounge around and, and enjoy um, the, the nice weather. And this is the central square with the water features. Is, it also helps during the summer. And are, not, are they only entertaining for all sorts of ages, but they also mitigate for the heat that can go up very high. This is any normal afternoon uh, before COVID mainly. But uh, but nothing is happening because when something is happening in the square, this is how it looked like. And this is how it looked like before we had restrictions. And hopefully we'll get back to that pretty soon. But just to show you how much of a small investment and in relative to, you know, what a huge highways and infrastructure could cost um, can do for the life of the city. This is really the heart beating in a city that, that lives um, during 
during all the hours of the day. One other project that I want to share with you that really has made a change of the face of the city is the bazaar. You know, in Mediterranean culture, bazaars are not just a point of, of selling stuff, they're also a point of a place where people socialize, a place where people get to hear news. And this was, this is a very ugly picture, but this is what you know, this bazaar used to look like um, before the intervention. And this is the space just behind it. This is a public space. This is a common area. And um, without any expropriation, without taking away any property from anybody, with a little bit of intervention, this is how it looked after um, after we, we interfered. So a space where nobody would prefer to go or pass by at any point. Um, it was cleaned up like this. and the usage that it, got, it gets during the day is is like this. So it's not just a place where people buy and sell stuff. Um, previously, it only employed 100 people. The last count, there was 1,300 people employed in the same space, in the same market space um, that was there before, just with a little bit of facelifting and interventions. But it's also now a destination that just for people that live around the area, but also for tourists and for visitors as well. It has great restaurants and it's highly recommendable if you ever want to visit Tirana. Um, just a few pictures from it. The space that you see uh, with, uh, with the glass ceiling, that's where the market happens, but because it's so versatile, then during the evening or during um, the non-market hours, it has been transformed into a fashion show destination, into a party destination, concerts, a street theater, so all sorts of things and all sorts of usage right at the, at the heart of the city. The other uh, project I wanted to show actually comes from Greenshaw Architects, probably some of you know. Um, they designed the project. This was the this is the new boulevard of Tirana. Um, why do we call it the new boulevard? Well, because when the city was first founded um, during the Mussolini times, um, you, they had to have these huge boulevards for the military parades. And so the, the person who was in charge of the works here in Tirana is writing a letter back home to the headquarters and saying, um, you know, I've, I've seen cities without boulevards, but I've never, ever seen a boulevard without a city because really this boulevard that is the backbone of the city was built 100 years ago when the city itself didn't really exist. This was not a real city back then. And for 100 years, we had been growing around that same backbone. The city had been developing around that same backbone um, and it just simply was not sustainable. I was showing you the pictures from the satellite images before where the sprawl just goes around and around and around because that backbone is not extended. And we what we did was basically uh, just extend that boulevard. And this is how it looks like. So for the first time in Tirana, you had infrastructure come before the sprawl, so come before the development. So on both sides of the boulevard, then they can have, um, we planned for new development. So there's small buildings that you see, they are up for development as we speak. Um, but the infrastructure is there so that, you know, now you finally have a direction of how the city goes and how the city grows. And this goes on until the edge of the city, which is the, the uh, river, so that the, the really uh, borders of the city. Um, why is the boulevard important for us? Well, because it's the first very democratic project. And what do I mean by that? When we're talking about planning, yes, we talk about solutions, but we also have to consider democracy in our planning. And in a city that um, where 70% of the citizens are not um, owners of a vehicle, that means that 70% of the space should go to non-vehicle owners, should not be a space for cars, should be a space for pedestrians, for uh, people who want to use our bike, for people who just want to use this space for entertainment purposes or for relaxation purposes. And so if you look at the width of the boulevard and all the pedestrian and all the park space, um, that's really what it, what it reflects. And the cars only 
you know, have that limited space that they do. This could have been a four lane both way street or boulevard, but it wouldn't be a metropolis. It wouldn't be a urban space, a livable space. And so when it opened, it was so walkable and so livable that other than the, the spaces that were designed for pedestrians um, during the first days where, you know, this was not really open for cars, people invaded also the car space. And just to show that how much much space was needed and how much um, people had needed this um, interaction with the city and this um, love with the city on using its spaces in the, their own way, not in the way that we designed them for cars, not in the way that cities had been designed and Tirana had been managed to make more room for cars that were growing in number, but for the people. This is the 70% of those who do not own a vehicle and do not want to own a vehicle and want to leave the city their own way um, and the next project I wanted to show you guys is um, how we moved from a city with zero playgrounds to a city that now is counting more than 77 playgrounds this was the first one that we had after a, a terrible terrible campaign against playgrounds, um, not per se playgrounds, but against having interventions in the park because we started from the central park um, and then we moved on to all sorts of neighborhoods. Our playgrounds are all inclusive, so they um, work for ages from six months old to uh, 14, 15, so also space for teenagers, but why, what you mean by all-inclusive is because they may, they don't just serve kids, they serve the whole community. And if you have grannies and uh, parents going down the, they're going down the neighborhood and using the neighborhood playground, they also interact with each other. Other than the physical activity and the fun and the play, which is so important for, for children, it's also the community interaction. It's also the space that people find um, that just just close to their in the proximity of, of their of their apartments with interaction with each other. If we have playgrounds and where we live, we also build communities. We also build safe spaces because places with a lot of people um, going in and out and getting to know each other are also safe um, to whatever danger might be out there. Our commitment in this office was to build a playground for every month in the in the office. We've, uh, we're happy to say we've surpassed that. So now from zero we're counting 77 playgrounds and our deal with the citizens of the city is if you make space, we'll build a playground. So, you know, if the community gets together and they identify a space that is idle, such as this, then we transform it into this with a little bit of investment, but also participation from, um, for, from companies and from um, other donors that want to be part of the, of the city being developed. So idle spaces like this have been transformed into huge livable spaces like this. And I could just show you guys, you know, lots and lots of examples, but, but really how a little bit of, of um, um, unification into the same kind of objective of living better uh, can transform spaces that would have otherwise um, just been idle and you know not gotten a lot of buck for the um, for the space. So um, the next thing I want to show you is our bike lanes. We also started from zero kilometers of bike lanes and we're now counting 50 kilometers of completely dedicated and fully protected bike lanes. And I would love to show people pictures of the kids riding the bikes because other than the physical infrastructure of the bike lanes, there, there needs to be a little bit of more soft infrastructure. And um, the soft infrastructure starts really from an early age. We have in our kindergartens and our nurseries, um, for kids that are three and above, uh, we have this, you know, kind of class that they take um, in the playgrounds of their, or in the, in the backyards of their, uh, of the kindergarten, where we teach them how to bike. And once they've learned how to bike in the safe enclosed space, we then take the kids in the bike lanes um, in groups and such as this one, which is super cute. But what does that do? Um, not just teaches the kids independence and the fact that they can also leave the city in the same way that you know grown-ups do, but it also gives a huge message to the drivers um, and to passerbys and to 
parents and to adults. Because, you know, if you see a small kid going through a bike in their lane um, close to where you're driving, obviously you're going to be a lot more careful. And hopefully you're going to be thinking about, you know, your next ride being on a bike rather than on a vehicle. So um, then it just pulls adults out and, you know, they pull out their bikes and, and get to leave the city in the same way that kids do. So it also is a little bit of an education for all ages. And so there are some of these very picturesque bike lanes that we have. Um, they are so um, in style that you know even pedestrians want to prefer to use them so it's a little bit of a challenge there but altogether it's how to be friendly with people who decide to be more respectful of the city ultimately and live it in a more inclusive way which is through biking and walking so just small interventions throughout um urban spaces this is not central this is um really in the outskirts of the city but how to be a little bit more playful and respectful of people who did decide to walk and do not, uh, you know, spend thousands and thousands of, of euros on a vehicle, but have to be equally respected and equally cared for um, in a city of a million. Um, part of those interventions, other than the protected bike lanes, this is just one of our pop-up bike lanes where there's not major infrastructure, there is just physical barrier um, to protect people um, when they're biking, is also enlarging our um our sidewalks um the, the one picture in the middle this used to be half of what it shows there and it just gives people a lot more space not just for um, strolling but also for walking and especially during covid when we need a little bit more distance from each other and also introducing little playful elements in pedestrian areas or in areas where you have generally the community um, hanging around with each other a lot more. So um, a lot more interventions there. Um, city, the city as a whole and our green urban spaces were a huge lifesaver for us during COVID. Um, and I must say that is just, this is one of the many pictures of all sports being pulled out of this enclosed spaces. And uh, this is the, the center of the city. This is really close to my office. And this is where the guys were, were still practicing sports, but, but in a safe, safe environment. And without those interventions, if we hadn't been doing those interventions, then all, obviously this would have been a lot more uh, difficult to handle um, in terms of public health and in terms of um, interaction with each other. We are committed to our orbital forest, which is part of our um, urban plan, uh, our urban plan Tirana 2030. Um, the orbital forest is designed by um, Stefano, Stefano Boeri architects. And what it means is the city needs to put an end to the sprawl. And what the forest does is it basically creates a, a natural kind of wall to to put the physical space into how development occurs. So within the borders, you can develop vertically outside the wall, then you uh, can develop with very limited intensity uh, for basically um, uh, rural type of developments. And what it entails is in the planting of two, approximately 2 million trees, part of which we are working with EBRD right now, where we have identified the areas where there's going to be more intensity of planting trees um, and, and basically completing or, or starting to complete most of this uh, perimeter that it shows in our urban plan. Um, why this is important it requires a lot of financing, not just because you know trees cost money, but because um, it might be one of the first in nature investments that we do in Tirana, where you do not um, interfere in heavy infrastructure, you interfere in natural infrastructure, but how that pays back to a lot of, um, it pays, pays you back financially in terms of um, not just building a more resilient city, but also being able to increase um, market value for for the areas, real estate value for the areas where there's more greenery and where trees are planted. Also, one of the technical elements of it is land where trees are planted is able to absorb a lot more water um, than land where no trees or there's uh, or concrete um, is is placed. And so, in a time where we're having extreme weather occurrences 
every other day, this is not just um, not just pleasant, not just increases the value of the city and the livability of the city, but it is so necessary in terms of all the measures that we take um, to make the city more resilient towards what's what's going on. So we, uh, this is one of our uh, most uh, committed projects. We have started this with 400,000 trees planted so far from, from the inception of our urban plans. And this has been a massive, um, a massive collective effort where you have kids planting trees for their birthdays and for anniversaries and and for class um, class celebrations and for teacher appreciation day. Any reason is a good reason to plant a tree or to plant a bush or to plant any kind of greenery in the city. Um, this is so true that you know there's nobody in Tirana today that has not participated in the tree planting planting um, in these years. That has been um, a very very popular sport to do. So we've had massive plantings and then more more modest ones with with small kids teaching them to to really take care of their tree and um, and plant more and instead of you know buying iPads and, and smartphones for their birthday, uh, getting their own tree in the city. The last project I want to share with you is new neighborhoods. Um, unfortunately, we had a massive earthquake in 2019 that um, destroyed many, many, many buildings in Tirana and in neighboring cities. Um, but, you know, every tragedy can turn into an opportunity and we decided to turn it into an opportunity because a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people had to leave the apartment buildings where they were living um, and had to, and those had to be demolished. So people had to move to new buildings and we had to rebuild. We took this opportunity to actually do proper neighborhoods. So, you know, if you're tearing down one and two buildings and then two are left and the other two are have to be demolished, why not Re reconceptualize whole neighborhoods, not just because you have to give people back their homes and not just because this is a social project, but other than just being a social project, how about it being a urban exercise of livable neighborhoods? And so the new neighborhoods are not going only going to be uh, housing people who've lost their homes during the earthquake, but um, they're also going to become sustainable neighborhoods where you have space for institutions, you have also commercial space, you have space for services, and you have this mixed use of, of um, buildings and space in between. So that you double use what you build for a certain purpose. During the day, um, this is just as any other space where people go to work and they have, you know, there's, a, there's the high rise buildings where you have um, public institutions that are going to move there but also private institutions and office space and after hours the same space so the same parks that work for for people in the office work for the neighborhood and for their residents so this is not just a building um, housing for people who couldn't afford to build their own houses after they lost them after the earthquake because then it would have you know, we all we all know these examples of social housing that can become um, sketchy neighborhoods. But this is a all usage neighborhood, and not only does it make a great use of the common areas for both institutions and residents, but also it ensures that it is uh, marketable. It is profitable and it gives back to the city um, not just revenues but also um, sustainable development and making it right as it should be. Um, again, this is one of the neighborhoods that is designed by um, Stephenberry Architects. There are three other ones that we are building throughout the city, but just to show you that this is the concept of them developing. Um, they are in the middle of the city and they, this is a city done right, so neighborhoods done right, and that is our um, the last project and something that we're working on. I'd love to share more details. Uh, hopefully, this was a little bit of uh, a teaser, and and then we can move on the conversation with with more details about this. Thank you so much for bearing with me throughout the slides, and sorry for the technical problems. Anula, thank you. That was truly fantastic. It's such a bold and beautiful vision, I think, the transformation of, of Tirana and Albania. Um, you can see it there with the Skanderbeg Square project by 51N4E, just the, the decision to 
prioritize people and not cars, I think is something that you can see throughout all of those wonderful projects. Um, I wanted to just ask you a bit about the Green City Action Plan and the manifesto, because yeah. I think there's obviously, ch you know, children are a very important part of that. How do you make sure in that action plan that you are managing to address all of the changes that you wanted to, to push through? So the, the Green City Action Plan uh, really came, we were one of the first cities to, to work with this. Um, and what we learned from our work was that this, the Green City Action Plan should serve as a filter. So a lot of the work had been done and had been addressed in our urban city development like or our urban development plans, our general plan. But the Green City Action Plan really put a little bit of more of a green loop into uh, um, yes, we have projects for how the new neighborhoods would look like, but do the new neighborhoods have um, efficiency criteria, energy efficiency criteria? Do the new neighborhoods have uh, green space criteria? Do the new neighborhoods have resilience criteria? Do they have a plan for the usage of the water? Um, and so on and so forth. So not just for the urban development as a whole plan, but also for our public infrastructure and for our public investment works, this serves as a filter and it goes through that criteria of the green city action plan and if it doesn't meet the criteria then the plan is back and you know that project uh, goes back to the table we, we consult with the engineers and with all the stakeholders and we make sure that it does uh, but the green city action plan and i love to say this because it's so important we all want to have green cities but no action plan works unless it's financially sustainable so the next point of the green city action plan is it's great to have 100 projects that are part of the green city but where do you actually start and which are the projects that actually give you back revenue in order to ensure that you move on to the next and to the next and to the next so the continuation of that is what we're actually doing right now which is the financial roadmap of the green city action plan the forest which i mentioned is actually one of the of the projects that make more sense to be done first so you know before we move on to the treatment of um the sewage waters um the forest is the one that comes before why does it come before before because you have to ensure that your revenues are going to increase in order for you to be able to afford more financially challenging projects later on if you just start from one and get stuck with that then the others won't be able to be done and everything has its timing and everything has its logic in terms of how you invest money we all want to have the great city but the resources are limited and that has to make sense yes i mean i think it seems like you're doing a brilliant job of sort of planning this out, I think, and the different scales that we've just seen in your presentation sort of shows that that sort of thinking is very uh, joined up, but you're able to apply it to different scales from the bike lane to the orbital forest by Stefano Boyeri. Um, Richard had asked, we've got time only for one question, I'm afraid, because we are running late. Richard had asked by, by a chat, um, how are you managing to do all of this and keep that sort of very um, Albanian um, character going? There are some incredible buildings in Tirana. And I think probably what we couldn't see in your pictures was how actually your new spaces are opening up vistas of, of old buildings. And mm -hmm. so maybe to reassure Richard uh, in our audience, how are the old buildings being being connected to all these new projects? Um, I will just want to show Richard one, well, I don't have a picture, but there is this old building, and this has been a challenge, so this is not to make the, the yes or easy. Um, the old buildings and old historical buildings in Tirana, um, they're almost all of them, well, I want to say almost, but actually all of them, they have been private properties. So the challenge there has been to really mitigate the need for the private investor to develop their own way and to kind of like put a criteria on them but to still uh, make it marketable so you don't want to have old buildings that are run down and they have no use just because they're old unless you know you want to yes you want to preserve them but that's not long-lived preservation and unfortunately, the city is not rich enough to buy out all these properties, that is private properties, and to make it historic and to restore it and so on and so forth. So it has been in a 
negotiation between the two parties um, and it has been obviously you know a a kind of work in progress but i'm very proud to say that um one of these iconic buildings and, and several of them that are in the center that have been developed privately they have been developed with that kind of character as the city we've given design assistance we've given planning assistance for free to private developers in order for the restoration to look um, and to respect kind of like the, the cultural heritage of Tirana. And in extreme cases where this cannot, has not been able um, to be achieved, uh, we have actually expropriated uh, iconic buildings that have had a symbolic uh, value for the city and we've expropriated them for private uh, donors. And one of these iconic buildings right in the center of the city is going to become the next uh, museum, the city museum. And it, the the papers just closed, but that is, uh, it's called the Sarayat. I don't know if you've ever been to Tirana, but it's really next to the Plaza Hotel, so the central uh, part of the city. And it's such an iconic building and, and I don't know how many tens of owners it had that were, would not agree on what to do with it. Um, and so the city did expropriate it and it's going to become the, the symbol. It's an ongoing effort, I must say. Well, I think there we have to leave it. I have been lucky enough to visit Tirana a few times and it's the most incredible city. I think great architecture, people, food, it really has everything going for it. And I think um, congratulations actually is all I can say on, on the Green City Action Plan and how it is moving forward um, with sustainability and culture at its heart. I think we do have a lot we can learn from what you're doing. So I just want to say a very massive thank you to Deputy Mayor Anula Rustani. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank um, you. Thank you, thank you all. With, um, yeah, thank you all for joining us. A great talk and I enjoyed spending time with you very much. Thanks, Anula. Thank you. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Let me just answer Michael here very quick. No, all the events that happen in the public spaces, they are free of charge. Um, and yes, I hear your concern. And if they're not free, then uh, that space is used, that, that space is, is basically uh, rented from for like a fee. But all of the events that we organize are free of charge. And even if we do it with third parties, we try and involve sponsors in it. This is a public space and so it should be. So yeah, <laughs> going to address that last concern. Yes, yes. And sorry for anyone's questions we didn't answer. We'll try and Fine, we'll share the talk. It'll go up on our YouTube channel. Um, anyone that isn't already following us on, on the Building Center, Twitter and Insta, please do, because we'll be sharing this talk and all our upcoming events program. Yeah, so thank you, Anula. Great work, lovely to hear about it. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>